Hi everyone, thank you so much for joining this webcast on how to green your lab produced by us over at Nature Careers. My name is Jack Leeming, I'm one of the editors here at Nature Careers and I'll be um, hosting this little webcast we put together. Um, this is a, a subject that's close to my heart so I'm really pleased we've been able to put it on. Uh, in just a moment I'm going to uh, make way for Namrata Jain of My Green Lab um, she'll be giving the first talk today, and that'll be around working as an early career researcher and greening your lab from that sort of perspective. After Namrata, we'll hear from Catherine Ramirez Aguilar of the University of Colorado Boulder. She'll be talking about greening your lab uh, as a lab manager, in particular, looking at things like space saving techniques and other ways, uh, and equipment usage, and other ways to potentially green your lab and make it a more ecologically, environmentally friendly place. After Catherine, we'll hear from Cynthia Milagre at Sao Paulo State University, who'll be giving us uh, a slightly different perspective as someone who, uh, from South America, and she'll also be talking through some of her strategies for uh, avoiding too much lab wastage and growing a green lab. After all those three talks, we'll move on to a question and answer session. If you are interested in asking a question, please do click the Ask a Question button. It should be somewhere on this video player. You can type those in and we'll see them live and we'll try to get to as many as we can in around half an hour. So uh, thanks so much for asking and we'll get to as many as we can. Uh, the last thing for me to say before I hand over to Namrata is that this particular webcast is very kindly sponsored by Nature Research Editing Services. Uh, if you are interested in having your, your research edited, um, then Nature Research Editing Service is a really excellent place to do it. They'll uh, look at your written English and also your clarity and effectiveness, your writing, and giving they'll give some good, uh, high quality comments and feedback on your on your writing. If you are interested in learning more, please go to authorservices.springernature.com to check out some more information. That's authorservices.springernature.com. Thank you again to Native Nature Research Editing Service for allowing us to put on this webcast. That's it from me. Uh, I'll look forward to seeing you at the questions and uh, thanks very much for watching. Uh, now on to Namrata's talk. Hello everyone. My name is Namrata and I work with a nonprofit organization called My Green Lab. Our mission is to build a global culture of sustainability in science. I come from an academic background with a PhD in chemistry and I've spent about seven and a half years of my professional career working in labs. Today, I'm here to talk to you about how you can green your lab as a researcher or as someone who works in or supports a lab. Science allows us to understand the world around us. It advances human health and well-being and creates the building blocks of new technologies and materials. But in addition, it incorporates a large environmental footprint and leads to the consumption of a significant amount of energy and water. It also generates a lot of plastic and hazardous waste. There is a vast potential to improve the way that science is conducted today and to incorporate sustainability into our lab practices. So before we start talking about how to green your lab, we should first learn our motivation towards it. Why is it that we need to think about greening your lab? One of the first reasons to think about lab sustainability is in understanding the impact that research has on the environment. Most lab buildings and the work that's done in them consume three to 10 times the amount of energy as a standard office. Labs also use a fairly high amount of water, approximately two to four times higher than that of a commercial building. For example, a typical autoclave uses more than 19,000 liters of water a week. The same can be done said about waste. According to a study done in 2015, 5.5 million tons of plastic waste is discarded each year from labs and sent to landfill. This amount is approximately 2% of all plastic produced globally and equivalent to 434 billion plastic water bottles. And all of these statistics point to the fact that there is a vast potential to decreasing the environmental footprint of scientific research. So now that we know what is at stake, Let's dive into how you can make science sustainable. Here, I'd like to share a little bit about my journey in the world of lab sustainability. During my graduate program at the University of British Columbia, or UBC, 
I started a sustainable science organization in my department called Green Chem UBC, along with two other co-founders. The inspiration for this group started through a similar organization in Canada, which had been operating for about four years at the time. The other co-founders of Green Chem UBC and I reached out to them to exchange resources and share their experience with us, which set us up on the right path from the get-go. The first few steps included contacting the right stakeholders. In our case, that included our department head and some key faculty members, the Sustainability Society of UBC, and the graduate student group of our department. And once we got some funding and gained some supporters, we started putting together information sessions about promoting sustainable practices and spreading the word with some fun events like trivia. It also helped to organize seminars regarding green chemistry research, doing outreach within other departments, and organizing networking events with sustainable science professionals. If you're thinking about establishing a green lab advocacy group in your organization, some of the first few things that you can do that can generate a lot of impact is organizing department-wide recycling and waste segregation drives. You can also participate in chill up challenges, which includes raising the temperature of negative 80 freezers to negative 70 degrees. We also believe that green chemistry is a crucial part of lab sustainability. So if you're responsible for teaching students about chemistry or running a chemistry teaching lab, there are guides and tools to transition to greener and more sustainable labs. One of the ways to do that is the adoption of green chemistry in standard undergrad curriculum. And I'd encourage you to check out the guide called Green Chemistry for Undergrad Organic Chemistry Labs, which has been created by three organizations that are committed to promoting green chemistry in higher education, My Green Lab, Melipore Sigma, and Beyond Benign. Beyond Benign is one of our partners with a mission to provide educators with the tools that they need to make green chemistry an essential part of chemistry education. And one of their programs called the Green Chemistry program, Commitment Program offers access to a broad and supportive community of green chemistry experts. It's a volunteer and flexible framework for green chemistry curriculum and training. Let's now think about what you can do to bring these concepts together and creating change in your labs. In the next few slides, I'd like to leave you with a few ideas for how you can get started to be more sustainable in your lab. Fumoods are one of the most energy intensive equipment in labs. A typical fume hood can consume as much as three and a half homes worth of energy at the same time. And in terms of energy con conservation, one of the best things you can do is to keep your fume hood sashes closed when not in use. Another easy to implement way to save energy is just being diligent about turning lights and other lab equipment off when not in use. It also helps to be proactive about discussing this with others that work in your lab and making sure that the responsibilities are clearly communicated. The other large energy consuming equipment in the lab is lab freezers and fridges. And taking steps to make sure your freezers and refrigerators are well maintained helps ensure that you can keep these units healthy, minimize energy usage and protect your samples. A few things to periodically do are check the door seals for tears, uh, defrost and remove ice regularly, and clean the filters and vacuum coils that collect dust and prevent efficient heat exchange. Negative 80 freezers, especially those that are several years old, can consume as much energy as a whole house. Whether you have a new or old freezer though, simply changing the set point from negative 80 to negative 70 degrees can cut energy consumption by about 30%. Lab waste is one of the most concerning aspects that surrounds scientific research. Some of the quick tips to reduce lab waste lie in the age-old concept of reduce, reuse, and recycle. It helps to get to know your waste and identify your largest waste streams. Proactively think about what you can recycle. Planning experiments ahead avoids the use of repetition and hence the use of more resources. There are a variety of vendor take back programs based on where in the world you are, and it may be worth investing time in learning about them and taking advantage of them when appropriate. Overpurchasing co contributes heavily to lab based as well. By being organized and maintaining a well-kept inventory and sharing reagents, 
you can divert some of this waste away from landfill and incineration. So now that we know some simple ways we can act, where do we go from here? Well, this is where organizations like My Green Lab come into play. We help raise awareness of the fact that science has a large environmental cost, and we provide solutions to this issue by sharing best practices and case studies across the Green Lab community around the world. As a mission-based nonprofit, we work with many different institutions, from smaller academic labs to some of the most recognizable names in biopharma and biotech industry. And in the next couple of slides, I would like to share two of our programs with you, which directly pertain to answering the question of how to green your lab. The first one is the My Green Lab Ambassador Program. One of the first things you can do is to educate yourself, learn about what matters in lab sustainability and what you can do about it. The Ambassador Program is a wonderful entry point into the lab sustainability field. It's a free crash course in lab sustainability and it's available for any, anyone and everyone. Since the program started in May of 2020, we have about 800 people join this network already. The next program I'd like to share with you is our Green Lab Certification Program. This program is our flagship program and it's considered the international gold standard for lab sustainability best practices. The My Green Lab certification is set up as an online self-assessment that all of your lab members can take, and it assesses your current sustainability practices. We then provide recommendations for improvement in 14 key areas of lab sustainability. And after that, your lab is given an opportunity to implement these changes, and you finally take a self-assessment a second time to get your certification level. This program particularly focuses on behavior change and leverages practical, easy to implement things that lab members can do to incorporate sustainability best practices. And with that, I would like to thank you all for your attention. I would like to thank Nature Careers, the organizers of this webcast, and particularly Jack Leeming for the invitation to speak. And remind you that regardless of where you are in your sustainability journey, my Green Lab and the wider lab sustainability community are eager to support you in the next step that you wish to take. Thank you very much. Thank you, Namrata, for that talk. I'm now going to hand it over to Catherine. Hello, everyone. My name is Kathy Ramirez Aguilar. I manage the Green Labs program at the University of Colorado Boulder, a program that I pitched to the university in 2009 and have been building and creating ever since. However, this is not where my career started in laboratory science. I first came to CU Boulder for a doctoral program in analytical chemistry, and then continued on into postdoctorate research in biochemistry. It was while I was in my postdoc position that the large resource consumption of scientific research became increasingly troublesome to me, and I felt the need to take action. After all, I found myself in labs surrounded by humming equipment that we left on all the time, even when not in use, like these floor centrifuges and this biosafety cabinet. Down the hallway, there was a room with autoclaves where the sound of the water constantly gushing down the drain made it hard to even talk in the room. And there were large solid waste streams of materials flowing from the lab, such as foam boxes and pipette tip boxes, to name just two. And all the while, the only item in the lab that was asking us to save on resources was this sticker on the light switch. I thought to myself that we must be able to do more in labs than just turning off the lights when we leave. Since 2009, in collaboration with engaged colleagues across campus, we have been successful in setting up a wide range of efficiency and sustainability efforts that campus scientists can participate in, including diverting a number of lab solid waste streams from the landfill, some of which are shown here, implementing water efforts. As an example, I've shown a picture of a waterless condenser that we've been able to offer to, for free to campus scientists. We've also implemented numerous efforts around energy savings. These three images touch on a few, including turning off equipment when not in use, closing the sash on variable air volume fume hoods, and efficient cold sample storage practices. As the program became established, I wanted to think bigger about the positive impacts that CU Green Labs could have. So I began looking at underlying issues that were leading to inefficiencies in scientific research and thinking about how changes could be integrated into systems to benefit large scale ongoing improvements for efficiency. One issue that I have been particularly focusing on over the past seven years 
is growing a culture of equipment sharing. Based on my experiences, let me explain why there is so much untapped efficiency to be gained from equipment sharing, especially for equipment that is not overly expensive, such as those pictured here, that individual lab groups can often afford to buy on their own. When an individual lab group has equipment that is just for their lab and is unshared, and then that lab's research changes and heads in a new direction, oftentimes equipment becomes underutilized or unused, and the laboratory space becomes storage space for that equipment waiting to be used again. For example, I have seen multiple floor centrifuges and, incub and incubating shakers become countertops or biosafety cabinets and even fume hoods become storage spaces for boxes. If that equipment had been shared, it wouldn't matter if the direction of the research changed. Other labs could still utilize those resources. Some of the equipment can be quite valuable and some may not be worth as much, but the wet laboratory space that is holding the unused equipment certainly is valuable and expensive. At CU Boulder, for example, a thousand square feet of new lab space in a building construction project will cost on the order of 1 million US dollars. Over the years, CU Green Labs has worked to raise awareness with campus scientists and many other stakeholders in campus operation and, and administrative positions of the many benefits that managed shared equipment brings. To help with cultural shifts, we have made posters on the topic, such as this one, given many tours in partnership with shared equipment facility managers and written white papers for campus visioning efforts. We have also written this case study on the CU Boulder Biochemistry Shared Cell Culture Facility to document and serve as an example of the cost avoidance and efficiency that comes from managed shared equipment. The left side of this graphic represents the amount of equipment that is in the Biochemistry Shared Cell Culture Facility at CU Boulder that 16 labs are sharing to conduct their research. Whereas the equipment on the right represents the amount of equipment that those 16 labs would have needed for their own individual labs if they had chosen not to share. Obviously, there's much more equipment on the right. As a result, this shared facility is leading to at least 30% laboratory space savings. In fact, this strong connection between shared equipment and efficient space utilization is one of the reasons why I have given so much effort to equipment sharing. As I mentioned earlier, laboratory space is expensive, but it's also energy intensive because of the ventilation needs. On the far right is a summary of the cost avoidance numbers calculated by the case study, resulting from these CU Boulder scientists choosing to share equipment with the manager in place. And at the bottom is a link to the in-depth case study. There is so much that research institutions can do to help advance greening of their scientific labs. First of all, on the topic of shared equipment, institutions can begin by setting up a shared equipment platform like this one here and then work towards engaging campus scientists as well as identifying system that will help populate that, pl that platform with equipment. Our campus has gone a step further by hiring a director of cores and shared instrumentation in 2020, whose main role is to enhance shared research resources on campus, but who also now oversees this website. Another idea, which I initially led with a group of scientists with pilot funding from CU Boulder, is the creation of this BioCore shared instrumentation program, whose manager shifts equipment resources where possible from individual labs to become managed shared resources, thus opening up scientists access to equipment. This young program has already avoided $900,000 in equipment purchases and an analysis by Financial Futures at CU Boulder estimates that if it was expand, expanded campus wide, it would avoid the purchase of 4.5 million US dollars in research equipment each year. Still on this topic of shared equipment, importantly, institutions can also structure new faculty recruitment, orientations, offer letter language, and startup package funding in ways to support and lay a cultural foundation for shared research equipment where possible. Lastly, I also encourage research institutions to create Green Labs programs and to start, they could find the funding necessary to hire a full-time Green Labs manager. Given the large resource footprint of research and the huge missed opportunities for efficiency within research, Green Labs programs that are, that are sufficiently supported and run by competent managers over time will result in cost avoidance for institutions that exceed the funding 
invested. Of course, there are actions that researchers can take as well. More and more scientists are reaching out to us and asking about creating a Green Labs program at their institution. My top suggestion to them is to gather an interested group of researchers and collectively advocate for hiring of a full-time Green Labs manager by their institution. This will bring long-term progress and success. Obviously, scientists can also promote equipment sharing between labs where they work. Other actions to take include promoting efficient space utilization, requesting the purchase of energy efficient and green lab products, and identifying sustainable lab practice, practice ideas to implement from the various green lab and lab sustainability web pages and lab assessment resources out there that already exist. Furthermore, scientists can help shift culture and stand out on applications for research positions, fellowships, and grants by including actions that they will take for efficiency and sustainability in those applications, demonstrating the culture and benefits to that research community that they will bring, such as maximizing the impact of research dollars and resources through sharing and efficiency and mentoring the next generation of scientists to do the same. These ideas and other suggestions can be found on this Bringing Efficiency to Research Grants or Better Grants website created by a working group that I chair with the International Institute for Sustainable Laboratories to help researchers and institutions to voluntarily incorporate the culture and actions for efficiency and sustainability into grant proposals. While this site has been created with US grants in mind, there is much information and, and, and ideas of interest to those outside the US as well. For multiple reasons, efficient science is the ethical direction to head. Because of the contributions of scientific research to the climate crisis and environmental degradation through its large resource consumption, and to maximize the positive impact that taxpayer and research dollars can have on innovation, understanding, and the ability to address the needs of people in the planet. Based on my experiences of working more than a decade in the Green Labs field, I feel strongly that the most impactful action that can be taken for widespread and also fast progress to green scientific research is to connect efficiency and sustainability expectations with the funding of research, such as those ideas presented on the Better Grants website. Research sponsors, such as granting agencies, have the power, the power to drive change by making these connections. But scientists can also advocate for making that change by voluntarily including their efficiency and sustainability actions in their grant proposals before research sponsors even require it. This will have large scale impact in my opinion. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Catherine, for that excellent talk. I'm now gonna hand over to Cynthia. Hi, I'm Cynthia Milagri and I'm an organic chemist by training. Thanks so much for having me. I'm so excited to be here today and talk about my experience working in labs with different realities in terms of incoming resources and instilling a green culture across other labs and institutes. Over the years, I could observe that usually resource poor setting labs adopt a greener workflow routine than resource rich ones, mainly driven by economic factors. I mean, most of the tips and recommendations we find out about how to bring your lab are already in course in those institutions. For example, single-use plastics are the bad guys nowadays, no doubt. As great as it is to recycle, it is better to eliminate single-use plastic through reduction or reuse. So what can you do? You can do a lot. You can, you, you can start by giving preference for glass materials over plastic ones whenever possible. You can also use refillable boxes for pipe tips instead of buying new boxes every time it is needed more tips. Solvents are also bad guys. They are widely recognized to be of great environmental concern once they are used in huge amounts. It has been estimated that at least half of the material used in pharmaceutical production is solvent. GSK has estimated that more than 70% of the waste associated with pharmaceutical production 
e solvents. Therefore, the appropriate selection of solvent for a process can significantly improve the sustainability of a chemical production process. And for that, a number of solvent selection guides have emerged. Assume you have already opted for less toxic, aggressive solvent. You could also use solvent recovery as a strategy for the reduction of solvent wastes. Of course, this choice will depend upon the original production of the solvent, what is their environmental impact, and so on. Well, another relatively straightforward strategy that reduces cost and waste is the free trade items such as furniture, lab equipment, or any usable item that otherwise may be disposable. Laboratories consume a lot of energy. As a matter of fact, the amount of energy consumed in a lab facility is much more than the energy used in an average non-lab academic building. So we should pay attention to all the small things we can do to save it. For example, turning off the lights when you leave the lab during the day. Before leaving the lab, make sure that you turn off all electrical devices if they are idle. Turn off your computer's monitor when not in use. Do you know that the monitor consumes over half of the energy used by average computer? And a critical lab equipment that consumes a lot of energy is an autoclave. Some very easy actions that may be taken to help reduce energy consumptions are consolidate loads. Don't run an autoclave to sterilize a single box of pipe tips. Right size your autoclave. If you don't need a large autoclave, use a smaller one instead. Consider energy and water efficiency when purchasing autoclaves. Install water-saving devices on existing autoclaves whenever possible. And speaking of operational use of water, installing aerators on faucet is also a good tip. Encouraging the using of drinking fountains is an excellent alternative for the rational use of water and the reduction of plastics if people use reusable mugs and bottles rather than disposal ones, of course. Repurpose things. How many conferences and scientific events have you attended or organized? Have you ever considered transforming your poster into a reusable bag? Well, some years ago, we established a win-win partnership with a local NGO to do this. And besides the, re the waste reduction, we are also helping in a social empowering. All these initiatives are meaningful only when you and the people in the lab help improve the efforts to reduce, to reduce the waste generation. But what about the governmental and institutional power in instilling a top-down culture across labs and institutions? The creation of platforms that connects scientists to donate or share reagents is economical and environmentally helpful, such as the social lab created by the University of Sao Paulo here in Brazil. Another important initiative is the encouraging and, in some cases, the obligation of equipment sharing. For example, FAPESP, the Sao Paulo State Funding Agency launched a multi-user equipment program to purchase state-of-the-art equipment and make it rationally available to the largest number of scientists and researchers in Sao Paulo, Brazil, Latin America, and other countries. The culture of green and sustainable chemistry needs to be spread even more. If you feel alone in the quest for green chemistry, what about teaming up with scientists enthusiastic about it? You can develop a research projects together, cover different and complementary areas, 
you can develop outreach activities and educational ones, all aiming to spread the green chemistry culture. That's exactly what the Center for Excellence in Sustainable Chemistry, a virtual center among six universities in Brazil, is doing. The power of community is huge. Building strong communities is the foundation for successful executions towards the green chemistry goals. In this way, the community achieves more than anyone could achieve alone. However, from my experience, the utmost meaningful action is to engage all community members, from directors, faculty, staff, students, to the cleaning agents, explain what and why the changes are happening. Talk to them, listen to their suggestions, and take them into account when appropriate. Everyone needs to understand the importance of greening actions, truly. Do not just communicate them without explanation. That's the key to failure. And last but not least, on the contrary, the most important thing, in my opinion, is to put effort towards educating and inspiring the future generations of scientists, and leaders to practice green chemistry. And for this, we have outstanding flags out there to help us, such as the Beyond Benign, the Global Green Chemistry Initiative by UNIDO, My Green Lab, to mention a few. Well, I hope by now you are inspired and encouraged to begin or to continue green your labs and surroundings. The impact is amplified when more people get involved. Gather lab mates on board by using an argument that resonates with them, be it protecting the planet, saving time, saving money, or positive practice. Remember, green choices begin with you. Thanks, Cynthia, for that presentation. We're now going to go into your live question and answer session. So hello everyone, and thanks very much for coming. Through the, the magic of modern technology, I'm now here live talking to you from our, our nature offices in London. Hello to all of our speakers, can I ask you to unmute yourselves please, just so we can, um, we can hear you. Um, we've already got loads of questions in from our audience, so thank you so much if you've already asked a question. Um, if you do have any questions for our speakers, we'll try to get to as many as we can in the next half an hour or so. Um, there should be an ask a question button somewhere around this video player. Uh, and if you have a question, please do feel free to type one in. I'm gonna kick us off with a question from uh, Sarah. Thank you very much, Sarah. Um, Sarah asks, I work in a physics and engineering lab. And are there any resources out there for uh, sort of good practices for, for green dry labs? I appreciate it's outside of um, kind of the scope yeah. of what we just spoke about there, but I'm just wondering if, if anyone's got any particular advice or could point Sarah to um, uh, to somewhere where she where she can look in some best practices for dry labs. Uh, why don't I, um, Kathy, you seem like you might have something to say. I'm not sure. Thank you. Um, well, one thing that I can think of is um, we have not necessarily done a lot with the physics labs, but um, one thing that comes up is like uh, vacuum pumps. There tends to be, in my opinion, a number of pumps that are used. Um, and there are some, there's been some developments for more energy efficient, resource efficient uh, vacuum pumps. Um, so so I think that's an area where, where it could be considered. Uh, certainly sometimes these pumps also need cooling. And so the ability to um, use process chilled water rather than single use tap water to cool is also something that could be looked at. Um, also, we have a, uh, in our physics department, we have a helium recycler. Uh, and so that is one thing that's also been implemented here for our, our physics department at CU Boulder. So that's another thing, um, you know, helium is becoming an endangered element. And uh, so that is another uh, item that could be looked at if there is helium use in, in the research. Thank you very much. Um, Cynthia, 
or Namrata, do you have anything in particular to add to that? Um, yeah, I, I might add just um, another point about plug load and energy conservation in, in physics and engineering labs. Obviously, a lot of equipment, um, equipment that are being used in those labs um, sometimes have to be plugged on the entire time, but it might be worth taking the time to figure out a good protocol of um, turning off the instruments when not in use, particularly computers um, uh, that sometimes just out of uh, uh, not being disciplined enough, just don't get turned off. I think that might be something to look into as well. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, those all sound like really sensible things. And I, I suppose also the, the space sharing message from all of your talks could, could equally apply yeah. to a to a, a dry lab, I suppose. Um, I'm going to move on from that question, but I'm going to come to you next into you if you don't mind. Um, but a lot of questions here, which I thought you might aren't answer. And there's a lot of stuff here about winning hearts and minds, I suppose. People are asking, how do I convince my my PI or other people in the lab to, to take part in, um, in, in these sorts of initiatives? And I wondered if you had any experience maybe coming up against some disagreements or... Um, or yeah, like I say, winning hearts and minds when it comes to taking part in initiatives such as these. Thank you. Cynthia, why don't we start with you, but I think this is a good question for everyone. Thank you. Well, um, I think it's a good idea to, uh, to talk with all your partners and with your PI. Uh, maybe during your group seminars, if you have, um, to discuss all these points of view and team up with those who are uh, who are uh, thinking the same way uh, you are, it's a good strategy. Right? But definitely you have to have the support of your PI and the, your institution. Uh, it, will, it will be uh, much more easier, I would say. Thank you very much. Uh, Kathy, you've got your, you just stuck your hand up, I think. Yeah, I just one one. One realization that's come to me over recent times is how important I think green and sustainable efforts in labs are for recruitment of talented researchers. Uh, and I think this can be done at many different levels, you know, the graduate student, postdoc, faculty, staff level, uh, because, you know, the generation of scientists that are coming up in the field, uh, you know, they've grown up with climate change. It's been a part of their entire lives. And, and what I'm finding is that generation of scientists is really interested in these green and sustainable efforts. And so in my opinion, um, you know, for PIs even, um, you know, to engage their interest, I mean, having these programs as part of a department, as part of a lab at every level, at the institutional level, to me, is a real attractant for, um, you know, talented researchers that are looking to do research, but not to have as much of a footprint for their research. So uh, I just wanted to bring up that point. Yeah, Thank you. And, yeah. And if I I can, mean, oh, absolutely. Um, yeah, if please. Can, oh, yeah, if I can um, add to that. So just from, from a scientist's point of view, I think um, winning the hearts and minds of people around you and engaging people um, who uh, you want to support you in those efforts. I feel like one of the things that I've learned is just getting to know your audience. So if you're approaching your supervisor, they are they might be more concerned with, um, let's say, safety in the lab or finances in the lab. So you can um, approach the con con um, conversation that way. Um, if it's EHS, um, you know, you can pull up some data from online and uh, uh, figure out the right way to approach them. So I think there is no like one formula for all that works. Um, different stakeholders would prioritize different things when it comes to lab sustainability. So just um, being proactive about um, the case that you're presenting would, um, I think would be really helpful. And um, I can also just add to that. So one of the things that uh, my Green Lab Ambassador Program deals with is exactly that. So it consists of four smart science training videos that follow a single lab journey towards sustainable research. So it's, uh, it's almost like a, a skit where um, uh, uh, members of the lab are trying to figure out these, uh, the answers to these questions about how do I approach my supervisor? How do I um, start a waste audit? So it might be helpful to, to go through them as well. Thank you very much. I have, um, I have something of a follow-up question to that point, actually. But first, um, I'm, I need to thank um, Alison, who just posted uh, in, in response to the, the dry lab question from earlier, Alison's just suggested, Sarah, um, it's worth going to warp-it.co.uk, which I, I see is some sort of signatory 
thing um, for dry labs. So that's in response to the dry lab question um, in, in energy usage. Thank you, thank you. I, I like this audience engagement. Um, the second point I'm gonna go back on um, is, is that point about winning hearts and minds by talking about money rather than necessarily the green impacts and, and knowing your audience and that kind of thing. And I just wondered if from your experiences, um, if that if that's generally more effective, I just wonder. I wonder how how do people generally react um, if you go at it purely from a moralistic standpoint? Um, I, yeah, I just wonder. Uh, I, I'd like to get a sense of, of how people weight it. I suppose is what I'm interested in. Um, Namarata, can I start with you and then go from there, maybe? Thank you. Sure. Um, yeah, I think I think. Um putting that point forward about finances, it does, it, it definitely is a really powerful tool uh, because pretty much everybody in a professional role has to deal with some kind of budget. Um, so that, that's, a, I think if, if you're able to collect materials about how um, a, a lab advocacy group in your organization will save money, I think that's a really powerful tool. But I, I do have to say that um, th there are a lot of people and a lot of um, uh, divisions in a university who are actually concerned quite a bit about um, health and, uh, and safety, um, better management, for example, like Kathy presented, like uh, having a shared equipment um, uh, facility is, is like a really a win-win-win situation. So there are really multiple facets to, to this approach. And I think it's worth looking into all of them to, to build a case. Thank you. Um, I, uh... Since you're all Kathy, do you have anything to add in particular to that? Yes, uh, yeah, on that question, I think it's a great question. You know, if Green Labs at CU Boulder is showing up to a conversation, it's already pretty much well known that we're there for sustainability and efficiency reasons. So I do actually often just spend my, my time talking about money because, um, you know, it's already assumed that we're there for the, the green aspects of it. And the money piece can be very powerful. Um, so, yeah, uh, if we could show cost savings or cost avoidance, I really think that just adds to the conversation and, and enables us to, to get there faster. And, and, um, and yeah, we, we, I think it brings on a lot of success on our campus to be really focusing on the cost avoidance and so forth. Um, I also wanted to point out too, that one of the things that we do to win over scientists is really focused on um, the positive, like highlighting the positive actions of scientists as a way to show what's happening on our campus. And that often serves as an example to other scientists. So we use community-based social marketing. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, yeah, Cynthia, please. Well, if I could add, uh, money and budget, it uh, are also uh, huge questions for uh, people who live in low-income countries, as I said. And we are we are doing this, and it's working pretty well. So sharing equipment and teaming up with people and um, uh, showing to your uh, Actually, our funding agency uh, obliges us to share equipment, especially the more expensive ones. So this is something we, we discuss on our uh, daily basis and uh, it works, but we need engagement. We need uh, core facilities or um, manager, uh, universities should hire people to manage those equipments Otherwise, researchers will start fighting with each other <laughs> because uh, especially when equip equipment uh, needs maintained and they are not working. So uh, things need to be very transparent, I would say. Right, and I, 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 I'm, we've, we've got loads of questions around sort of program managers and lab managers and things like that. So I will get onto that. But I want to, I want to stick with the money for just a second because it's, it's something that's interesting. I don't want to, I don't want to make the whole thing about the money, but um, I'm curious. I, I, I just wondered if, um, grant agencies and other sort of aspects of science obviously have huge power. Publishers as well have massive power in in causing change, right? And it shouldn't probably be entirely on scientists to to change what they do, right? We may, should maybe be in grant applications, things like that. I wondered if, um, first of all, you've seen any evidence of that. Um, are funding agencies requesting more environmental impact reports and that kind of, is there, is there a, a trend towards a more sustainable sort of funding agencies? And 
if you had any other thoughts sort of around that, should they be doing more? What else could could um, other parts of the scientific world do? Um, Cynthia, can I can I ask you that first, please? Thank you. Well, I I think this is pretty important. Um, it's it's uh, humans. They they don't like to 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 move from their um, the position they are. So. I say I, I can say that for us sharing equipment in the beginning was wasn't that easy. Uh, we faced a lot of resistance from research researchers from sharing equipment and so on. So if you don't have someone to push you to to do this, it's it's quite uh, unlikely to happen. I would say. Thank you, uh, Kathy. Any other thoughts, sort of, yes, around science, um, science society, and yes, and... I absolutely believe there is a huge need to connect efficiency and sustainability expectations to the funding of science. Um, this can happen at the grant level, as you're suggesting, Jack. It also can happen at the institutional level, as I mentioned in my talk, with startup package for new faculty and so forth, where possible. I mean, sharing is not always possible, but it's been my experience there's lots of missed opportunities where sharing could work so um you know one of the most exciting things for me is that the ukri so the united kingdom research and innovation has come out last year with an environmental sustainability strategy and as part of that they have a goal to embed uh environmental sustainability across all financial decisions by 2025 and that is really exciting for me to see that that is coming. Um, I think it's a great leadership example for the world. Um, so yes, I, I believe, um, you know, one of the reasons why I believe connecting it to the money uh, that's funding science will have such impact is because there's such competition for that funding. So, uh, you know, because of the strong competition and, 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 and people needing to get that money, you know, I think there'll be willingness to make those connections and make those changes. Another reason why we really need these connections is because in a lot of cases, the solutions aren't there yet um, for like, you know, um, you know, recycling lab plastics. We need a really good solution for that. But until I think the money that's funding research drives those type of things, you know, those solutions, I think that'll help develop those solutions um, that we need um, and, and like, for example, major, major pieces of equipment that can't be turned off at night, that never can be turned off. I think those developments just haven't happened yet. But when we connect efficiency and sustainability to the funding of science, I think those solutions will come along because the money is driving it. That's how I feel. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, Namrata, you've got your hand up. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so just coming from the university perspective, most of the major universities and I think research, research institutes as well have zero carbon goals. And to facilitate those goals, there are um, initiatives that universities generally come up with like sustainability initiatives, um, zero carbon initiatives. And um, in my experience, like Kathy mentioned, there are a lot of missed opportunities. There's money available for students, for, uh, for researchers, for faculty that just doesn't get um, taken advantage of. So um, something that uh, the university, my alma mater um, had was the, the UBC Sustainability Initiative. And um, they, they have grants particularly for starting a green lab uh, community or a green lab society. Um, that we didn't even know about until we really started looking looking into it deeply. So um, I think taking advantage of uh, of that money available would would also be really helpful for starting kickstarting some of these uh, lab sustainability initiatives. Fantastic, thank you, thank you all. I'm I'm really enjoying this, and we we've got loads of questions in. I'm I'm doing my best to kind of um, bring enough questions together. I'm going to move on from the money. Um, it's a really interesting point, but I don't want to spend all the time on it. Um, we we've. I had a lot of questions around that idea of a green lab manager or someone who kind of kind of coordinates uh, equipment sharing and that kind of thing. Um, lo there's lots of different questions here, but but some of them around um, the particular skill set that a green lab manager might be expected to have. What sort of training is available if someone's interested in becoming a green lab manager? Um, and any other resources? Uh, maybe if you know a PhD student was interested in kind of taking on that role in some some way, uh, where can they go? Um, so that's a lot. I am going to invite any of you to just jump in, whichever one of you feel feels sort of confident, giving some help and advice and, and places 
you know, other resources? I, I could probably start. Mine is mine is a small answer. So, sure, um, but this you. is this is just coming from my experience. Um, I was I I have a pretty heavy academic background. I've never worked in an industry, um, but some of the skills that I thought were are currently helpful to me in my professional role of um, representing my green lab. So I'm not technically a green lab program manager, but I still work in the field. Um, having a PhD, it it has taught me quite a lot of things that I'm directly using right now. Um, skills such as writing, um, skills such as project management, um, having that uh, knowledge of labs um, that, that I think uh, has been a significant um, aspect of my application to when I submitted uh, to my green lab. So I think there's, there's a little bit of an inertia between uh, among people who are in academia, who want to move to industry, who want to be um, professionals working in Green Lab, but not uh, necessarily uh, be doing like research and development. So I just want to encourage um, current PhD students and, uh, and postdocs who do want to uh, like endeavor in this field. It's a huge field, developing field. There are lots of opportunities available. It's just a matter of knowing the right people, networking, and having the right kind of knowledge. Thank you so much. That is, that is really helpful, for, I think, for, for anyone listening who's interested in sort of taking it on. Um, Kathy, you had your hand up. Is there anything you sort of add, add to that? Yeah, and then Cynthia, I'll get to you. Thank you. Sure, yes. I just wanted to add, I, I agree with um, what Namrata just said. I, I mean, having a science background really does help because you understand the culture, the dynamics, and the pressures that scientists face. And, and I think having that understanding of the laboratory environment um, and, and, the, and what scientists need to go through um, really helps with um, you know, working with scientists on a Green Labs program. But I also will say um, that I, I believe, you know, uh, that, that the, well, this is true. I mean, the Green Labs community is so sharing and so open. Um, they are an amazing resource, really. And we, the community is really willing to talk to people that are, want to go in this career and give advice. So I would highly suggest getting connected with the Green Labs community. And, uh, and, and you know, one way to do that is there's a Green Labs planning group. It's a Google group that you can join. Like you can even blast out a question. You know, I'm interested in getting this field. Are there some people on this list that could talk to me and share your, your advice and, and and help in doing that. So, um, it, and, and as Namrata brought up, this is a young field, really. I mean, there are, it's a growing field. And so there are lots of opportunities. So I encourage people, um, if they're interested to, to reach out to the Green Labs community, um, you know, having that science background is very powerful. You can always add the sustainability education on top of that. Um, so yeah, that's how I feel. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, Cynthia, any sort of additional thoughts in terms of yeah. becoming a Green Lab program manager, resources, that kind of thing. Thank you. Well, I, I would like, uh, I agree with my colleagues. Uh, the community is very open. Uh, I have a, a scientific background, but being a, my Green Lab ambassador and, and having my institute uh, signing the Green Chemistry Commitment from Beyond the Nine uh, helped me a lot because there are so many things we still need to know and uh, as uh, my colleague said, uh, we share, we, we have opportunity to talk with each other, to, to share experience. And I also, and it's also important to know the laws of your, of your country, what, is the, what are the regulations, because um, it's different from different uh, countries and Sometimes you just need to say, wow, you are running things out of the law. So we need to do this. And uh, Yeah, we, we had a really interesting point on that, actually. Someone, um, I'm sorry, I, I, I don't have a name to hand, but someone wrote in mentioning in Dutch legislation, you can't recycle lab waste, for instance. Uh, and there was any ways around that or, or what to do about that, which is I thought was an interesting point. Um, yeah, but you're, you're right. I guess there's, there's different international standards and that, that makes things potentially more challenging. Um, I interrupted you. Was there anything else? No, you were going, okay. that's right. it. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. Um, 
the next question I'm gonna I'm gonna jump into, um, which comes from Joseph and many others. So thank you everyone for your questions. Um, is around suppliers and industry partners. Um, a lot of people have said that that supply lab suppliers, um, an awful lot of lab waste comes from the packaging they of of the stuff they receive, um, or or maybe their you know their, they, their lab might be really green, but whatever industry partner or or other commercial people they're working with might not have that same sort of green approach. Um, so people are asking, is there a, some sort of list or ranking for suppliers um, of lab equipment? You know, is there any way to, to get some sort of green, to, it, what's the best way to assess the, the greenest option if you're, if you're that way inclined? Um, and also, should, should scientists consider the emissions of the people they're collaborating with um, when they're working on stuff? Uh, Cynthia, can I stay with you if that's all right, please? Thank you. Well, um... I guess Namrata will talk about the ACT labels from My Green Lab and where people can check. Uh, um, and well, here in Brazil, we don't have um, uh, many uh, available different suppliers. So sometimes we are uh, we don't have choice. We need to 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 take what we have here. But it's a good strategy to talk to them and. Uh, I, I feel they they want to do. They need to know we are really uh, to have this. You know, we need to talk to, to them and say, "Oh, could you?" I don't need all these plastics uh, packing the things you sent me. Can you just don't send them anymore? I will appreciate it. So I think it's uh, it's important to talk to them. Absolutely, thank you. Um, and yeah, and just ask the question, right? Uh, Namrata, any any other thoughts? Yeah, yeah, for sure. And I agree with Cynthia. Reduction is really one of the the easiest ways and the most effective ways to um, to reduce waste. Um, but we we definitely felt the need um, for for such a, a comparison when it comes to lab products, um, we haven't had the same convenience of kind of weighing between two products, comparing them uh, based on their environmental attributes. And, and that's part of why uh, My Green Lab introduced the ACT label. Um, so ACT is an acronym, stands for Accountability, Consistency, and Transparency. And um, this is how uh, people can look at and compare lab products. It's an eco-nutrition label, and the criteria is um, called the environmental impact factors. And um, manufacturers um, would submit their products uh, to be act labeled, and then uh, our third party auditors would um, do a complete audit of their manufacturing, their energy and waste use, um, packaging, end of life, and then provide an, a score um, to, to these products. And this can be, um, th we have a database, an act database that um, consists of a lot of these products who have that have been act labeled, and uh, that's that can be browsed on our website. So it's act.mygreenlab.org. If you if you do want to uh, view that database and see what has gone into some of these audits, and it can also shed some light on uh, these different aspects of um, of manufacturing and uh, end of life. Thank um, you very much. Project. Thank Go ahead you. And, and press that. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Kathy. I'm gonna I'm gonna skip you on this one because I want us to have more time for just one more question, if that's all right. Um, so, so I think loads of questions are coming in around sort of specifics, and I'm I'm wondering if each of you maybe have have one, if you could only choose one thing to change in a lab, what would it be? You know, one sort of actionable kind of measure um, for every every listener to this webcast to take away with them and, and think about what, what would it be if there was just one? Um, you know, people have written in around pipette tips, glove boxes, plastics versus glass, space management. Um, everyone's got loads of really specific questions around, around what they can be doing better. But if there's any single thing you'd recommend every scientist to do, what would it be? One small change. I'm putting you all on the I, spot there. Um, I, I can... Namrata, please, yeah, thank you. <laughs> sure. Uh, mine is actually pretty easy to do, I think. Um, but that really is just talking to people about it. I think if scientists, you know, like communicate well about these things, because everybody has these thoughts. People who are working in the lab, it's really hard to ignore uh, the lab. Base. So just 
being proactive about it, talking to to people can really make a lot of impact. So, so in terms of your individual actionable thing, it's it's more just just think about it, just start just com- considering just communicate. It. Yeah, the the power of community. Thank you very much, um, Kathy. You've been quiet for so long, so I'm gonna I'm gonna go to you next. Thank you very much, um, Kathy. Your thoughts? Yes. Please. Thank you. I mean, if I had to ask one thing of scientists, it would be to start to incorporate actions for efficiency and sustainability into their grant proposals, job applications, these type of documents so that it can help shift that culture. So, you know, if we can be doing that voluntarily before the granting agencies even require it, I think it'll shift it in that direction. It'll show their support for that and it'll get us there where we need to be with connecting it with the money. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, and finally, finally, Cynthia, uh, any last thoughts? What? Um, uh, yeah. I'll go for reduce. Try to reduce energy. Energy consumption is uh, needs to be reduced. So there are so many small things that we can we can do. And if you are um, a teacher or a professor, uh, incorporate this in your classes and talk to your students because the young generations, they are more uh, prone to, to, to adopt all these um, green chemistry culture. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, right, we are out of time. In fact, we've slightly overrun. So I'm going to call an end to this webcast here. I'd, I'd like to thank our audience so much for all of our excellent questions and for getting so involved in today's webcast. And thanks especially to all of our speakers. Thank you, guys, for um, putting together those talks and uh, and taking the time to answer all those questions. So we much appreciate it. Um, we really hope you will join us on the next webcast. Um, and until then, uh, Thank you so much to everyone for coming and we look forward to hearing from you soon. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.